The Islamic Revolution turns 44 and the Islamic Republic is standing tall, despite the maximum pressure or extreme pressure campaign by the West. How did it get there and what strides has it made economically? Well, in this edition of the program, we will look at some of the major achievements of the Islamic Republic, which will also include some sound bites of people's grievances during the Shah's regime, which you may have not heard. All right, some of the highlights coming up in this program. The oil economy under the Pahlavi regime, the resources of oil was plundered. Then comes the democratically elected Prime Minister Mossadegh, the oil aspirations that he had. Uh, we will take a look at that very closely. And also the different ways that Iran's economy has moved away from oil. Uh, another highlight, Iran's achievements. It has become a regional power, no questions about that. Uh, also, the expansion of the middle class is one of the fruits of the Islamic Revolution, along with the nationalization of key industries. And then something that was required, that needed to be done, and it was called the resistance economy. Uh, promoting economic self-reliance, also uh, defeating U.S. trade sanctions, one of the purposes behind that, and another reason to discourage extravagant consumption. Iran is a vast country in the West Asia region, which sits on huge oil and gas resources. Iran's oil industry began in 1901 after Qajar kings gave a concession to British speculator William Darcy to explore and to develop southern Iran's oil resources. Masjid Suleiman, located in Khuzestan province in the southwest of the Islamic Republic of Iran, was the country's first oil well. It was drilled in 1908. It is also the first oil well in West Asia. The discovery led to the formation in 1909 of the London-based Anglo-Persian Oil Company. In fact, the British government gained direct control of the Iranian oil industry. UK's hegemony over Iran's oil industry and its revenue triggered a backlash among nationalist Iranian politicians, including Mohammad Mossadegh, who later became Iran's prime minister. Mossadegh and his ally Ayatollah Khashani led a movement to nationalize Iran's oil, but the split between the two and Mossadegh's misplaced trust in the US led to his downfall. In 1953, the UK and the US staged a coup against Mossadegh and toppled his governments. Iran's oil industry and its revenues were once again under the control of Western countries, especially the U.S. and the United Kingdom. The Shah's regime used the oil revenue to buy Western weapons and industrial products, which mainly benefited Western producers. During this period, Iran's oil industry remained disconnected from other industries, particularly manufacturing. This separation promoted inefficiencies in the country's overall industrial economy. <laughs> It's time now to take a look at some of the social media posts. Uh, first off, uh, taking a look at uh, Ayatollah Khamenei in this post, the leader of the Islamic Revolution visited the exhibition of industrial capabilities at Imam Khamenei's Husseinia. It went on to say, based on the entry, the exhibition featured machinery, equipment, and products manufactured by various plants and factories in Iran. Iran's ministries of industries, energy, oil, and communications were all represented at the exhibition. Obviously, this shows the advancement of Iran. Next up, get to know the Islamic Revolution Guard Score. Here are some of the missions of Iran's Islamic Revolution Guard Score, or the IRGC, in brief. And as you can see over here, you can see the various ways that the IRGC not only secures Iran's security, but also its uh, activities in different fields when it comes to Iran's economy and the Islamic Republic as a whole. Next, the Islamic Revolution has taken the responsibility of saying no to the culture of the Western world so that the real future of nations can be determined through ignoring the Western culture. The hashtag here, important, powerful Iran. Then Iran's economy after the Islamic Revolution, the GDP, 1978 through 2021, 75%. Uh, and of course, we're looking at uh, the economic growth in 43 years after the Islamic Revolution, noteworthy, obviously, for this person to make this entry. All right, there you have it. I uh, wish we had uh, more time to actually peruse through some of these with you. But uh, let's uh, bring in our guest for this segment of the Q&A. 
We have Ali Rasmanpour, who's an international affairs expert, uh, joining us. Ali Rasmanpour, welcome to Economic Divide. All right, uh, from the time of uh, the discovery of oil in Iran, you have foreign powers who obviously have lots of interest or had lots of interest in it, especially when it comes to what came to exploiting um, Iran as a whole and to basically force it into concessions um, in order for them to contract the oil or extract the oil, that is, and then for, for them to uh, reap the benefits. Now, the nationalization of the oil industry was supposed to be a response to these foreign interventions led by Mohammad Mossadegh, the then prime minister of Iran. But he was forced out through a U.S.-U.K. coup, which we all know. What benefits would a nationalization have brought Iranians at that time if it had been nationalized? In the name of God, the, the compassionate and the merciful. From the time of uh, uh, exploitation of uh, colonial powers which were present in Iran during the past 100 years, and especially from the time oil was uh, discovered in Iran, uh, the British government, the colonial powers, on top of them the United States and Great Britain try to exploit Iranian oil. Uh, in these ways, we saw that different kinds of nationalistic movements in Iran, which try to just nationalize Iranian oil industry, but it was thwarted by the policies and especially by colonial policies of the British government. And they didn't allow Iran to just took control of its oil industry and send them into the international market. Okay, uh, Ahmed Saleh is our next guest. He joins us now. He's a political and economic analyst. Ahmed Saleh, welcome to Economic Divide. Uh, why do you think uh, when it comes to the deposed Shah of Iran, he was blasted so much uh, for devoting his, um, I guess, uh, ten, at the time, his tenure to uh, modernizing Iran. He was really blasted for that. Of course, the money to come from massive oil revenues. Um, basically, he was bulldozing his way into this mass industrializi industrialization program. Um, but uh, he was trying to push that through really quickly, um, which was said to be one of his downfalls. Of course, at the same time, it was plagued, from what we understand, by mismanagement and fraud. So much so that economists at the time actually privately acknowledged that, uh, you know, most of the money was actually wasted. Is that what happened? Let me give you an important example to elaborate more in details uh, of this mismanagement and misuse of the oil revenues. In 1971, when the Nixon shock took place and the price of the oil uh, increased dramatically four times approximately in the world and also due to the oil embargo of the Arab countries the quantity of the export of oil in Iran also increased drastically uh, the statistics there are different statistics but the minimum increase in the oil revenue of Iran per capita was 10 times so the income of Iran increased by 10 times but how this money was used a big portion or most of this money was used to just import the final products, consuming products from America and from European countries. So this money was recycled and went back again to the source. And we know that increased the loaning capacity of the banks in the United States and uh, this is called the cycle of the petrodollar, which saved the American dollar from drowning when it lost, after the Nixon shock, it lost 40% of its value against, for example, the German marks in less than a year. این کسری بودجه کار بکنیم. فهمیدی که مثلا در سال 2004 بوده 100 تومان الان شده دوبله اون قیمت یعنی دیویس هزار تومن من پول مون ندارم که بزرن دیگه کراه های منازل زیاده از حد بادا رفته است گندم سی سد و بیست درصد شکر سی سد و هشت درصد میرم میگه آقا آقای اون پرتغال نخورن گوشت هم که نخورن پس آقا نون هم که نه بس هوا بخورن که ما پنجاه درصد حقوق مونه باید بدهیم برای یک مسکن
It's time now for the Info News section of the program. First up, we're going to take a look at a subject called common currency. Who does it pertain to? Which countries? Well, Argentina and Brazil. They actually have begun talks on forming a common currency. Now, the currency would be limited to trade and would not replace the two countries' cur currencies. At this point, there are also reports that these talks are on hold. But according to the latest that we have, is that they are still in the process of trying to somewhat come up with a structure for that. But it's definitely in the works. Next up, uh, a look at Russia, Iran, and the trade between the two countries. Turnover is expected to grow under a new uh, trade or free trade agreement between Tehran and the Eurasian Economic Union. Now, trade has surged by 15% last year, reaching $4.6 billion. Also on a side note, uh, the news has come out that the SWIFT-like uh, banking system has now uh, been established between um, Russia and Iran. Uh, not established, it's actually now operational and it's, uh, has started uh, its operation in the past 40 hour, 48 hours as of the recording of this program. So that's somewhat related news there. Now, um, Nigeria is the next topic we're taking a look at in terms of the cashless environment there. Uh, it has launched a domestic card scheme to boost the cashless, uh, cashless economy in that country. Now, this move is part of the central bank's uh, efforts to reduce cash flow within the borders of um, the country, which is Africa's biggest economy. Next up, we're going to take a look at a topic that we haven't covered in a while. Um, and this pertains to Arab countries and the currencies in those countries as a whole. Now, uh, it, it, it appears uh, that there's government mismanagement and external pressures uh, that has been a result of the currency crash in some Arab countries. Now, why is that happening? Well, these um, Arab countries outside of the Persian Gulf has a have actually seen their currency devalue, and uh, as a result, inflation has risen. Now, one particular country that is suffering from this is Iraq. Iraq, however, is blaming the U.S. for its currency devaluation, and that leads some to believe that the U.S. is using uh, the dollar as a weapon, something that the U.S. has been accused of time and time again in the past. Those were the topics that we picked for our Infineus section. If you have a topic in your mind, uh, of wherever you are, uh, please do send them to us. Contact information is on your screens now. Before and after the revolution, this is the title for our in-depth section. After all, what better way to gauge how the Islamic revolution is doing by taking a look at these angles? But don't forget, this is looking through the economic lens. Obviously, there are other factors at play when it comes to the performance of the Islamic revolution as a whole. Okay, first up, let's take a look at uh, these industries, uh, in particular cement, aluminum, copper, and electricity. Um, when you take a look at them, uh, we want to see how they fared before, obviously, and after the Islamic revolution. Now, let me draw uh, your attention to the ranking in the world and the percentage increase when it comes to them, as you see over here. That's what we want to take a look at. These are unbelievable figures. The ranking, uh, 25, seven, uh, not the ranking, but the amount of volume of, uh, that it has increased by 25, 17, 35 fold that you see there. It's at the bottom of your screen there, 25 fold for cement, 17 fold increase for aluminum, and then you have uh, what? 35-fold increase for copper, electricity, obviously uh, also uh, to have increased in its production. Um, not only does Iran provide its people with the lowest price electricity in the world, its ranking is 16th in the world. So you can see how much Iran has improved ever since the Islamic Revolution. And if that doesn't convince you of how Iran has jumped leaps and bounds after the Islamic Revolution, well, here is another industry that may just blow your mind, the steel industry. Take a look at that in terms of the production and also in terms of the, the ranking. This just came out uh, uh, recently. Now, aside from the 19-fold increase and it being 10th in the world, uh, again, hold on to your horses. As of November of 2022, Iran's steel industry's ranking actually increased to the seventh place in, in the world with a production of 2.9 million tons. Now, to put things into perspective, uh, this is while EU faced a 10.1% decrease in its steel production due to the energy crisis. Okay. Now, as far as the Iranian economy goes, we took a look at the IMF. It issued a report predicting the gross domestic product or GDP of 192 countries of the world, including, obviously, the Islamic Republic of Iran. The body expects Iran's GDP to reach $1,599 billion in the current year based on the Purchasing Power Index, or PPI, the rate of which will increase by $150 billion as compared to last year. 
Now, according to the IMF statistics, Iran is the 21st largest economic power in the world in 2022, in spite of the tough economic sanctions that have been imposed uh, or placed against the country. And finally, the Western Maximum Pressure Campaign, especially by the U.S., well, has been one of the most severe in history, or well, maybe now second to Russia, but here are a few examples of the damage that it has done to Iran's economy. As you can see over here with uh, uh, oil production, 1.5 million bar barrels coming off the market, to revenue denied, uh, to corporations that have exited the country, obviously in these sectors, and these are just a few that uh, show the way that the Western uh, powers, particularly the U.S., have tried to uh, put extreme pressure on Elon, which has failed in terms of the maximum pressure campaign. Let me bring back our guests and get an idea from them. Ali Rez uh, Von Poor is an international affairs expert who rejoins us. Ali Rez Von Poor, welcome back to Economic Divide. Now, taking a look at uh, Iran in terms of it uh, being a regional power, I mean, we're looking at four decades, basically, of the way that Iran has been able to do that. Uh, different spheres, social, economic, diplomatic, and military investments. Um, and also, um, we are looking at Iran's civilian nuclear energy program to have expanded. Um, just in the steel sector, we have now uh, come in at seventh in the world. How did Iran reach these achievements now and not during the time of uh, the Shah and the deposed Shah and its regime? Uh, we have witnessed the advancement of Iranian, I mean, infrastructures, different kinds of infrastructures during the past couple of decades, especially about economic and also industrial issues. Iran has relied on its own ability, on its own knowledge-based companies, on its own knowledge-based institutes in order to improve its infrastructure. You have already seen that uh, regarding uh, nuclear, I mean, energy, uh, Iranian scientists have been completely successful in enriching uranium for civilian purpose uh, or for civilian usage and also they have used different kinds of I mean um, uh, knowledge different kinds of I mean advancement regarding nuclear technology in order to use in uh, different kinds of I mean infrastructures. Uh, so, uh, why Iran achieved these advancements and ach achieved these, I mean, improvements? Because it's, uh, even though, you know, the international community, especially the United Nations and also the U.S. government impose different kinds of harsh sanctions against Iran, Iran, by relying on its own ability, try to just prevent the harmful effects of sanctions on its own economy and improve its infrastructure and use them for the benefit of its own people. Okay, let's bring back Ahmad Saleh, political and economic analyst, to see what he thinks. Ahmad Saleh, I want to come at you with the uh, um, issue of uh, human resources, because when it comes to the advancement of any economy in Iran, obviously um, is the, not an exception. One of the things that does stand out um, is human resources, but that has to happen through educational advancements in a country, um, which Iran has uh, uh, really, uh, by leaps and bounds, uh, been able to excel in. Now, the big question is, how did it manage to do that in this sector? Um, because some are under the false impression that the Islamic establishment, um, when there's a, a government under that, that educational uh, mm, learning is not something that's going to uh, equal a Western one. So tell us more about that, if you can. One of the main purpose of uh, all the structures in a society, economic structures, social structures, political, military, anything, security, is the improvement in human resources. And United, Na United Nations has, an, has a very important index to compare the situation of countries in this regard. And this is the HDI, Human Development Index. Uh, which is very important and is mainly consists of, I mean, very different parameters, but mainly categorized into three different factors. The income of the population, the health, and the education. And if you compare those 120 countries, which are the high HDI countries, Iran's rank is among the top three countries. So this is like a miracle. I mean, the development of the human resources. And by this human resources, we are talking about men, women, and different types of people. All right, he mentioned the word miracle. It's a good time to take a look at um, the area of human resources through Iran's seventh development plan. Um, here is where it would be a good time to look at the role of women and how far they have come, thanks to the opportunities created for them. 
Well, the numbers speak for themselves, as you're about to see. This table outlines how far women have come in the Islamic Republic. Now, note the female literacy rate in rural areas, which uh, expanded from 17% all the way to 73%. No matter how you look at it, women have come a long way since the Islamic Revolution. Following the 1978 revolution, the National Iranian Oil Company took control of Iran's petroleum industry. Iran also tried to rid itself from Western companies to develop an independent gas and oil industry. Iranian officials also defined as intergenerational capital. Western powers have imposed sanctions on Iran in order to prevent the country's ability to extract and to sell oil in international markets. The sanctions have created problems for Iran, but Iranian officials have devised various plans to stave off the sanctions and to develop mega projects in the country's oil and gas sectors. The Islamic Republic is now a regional power thanks to four decades of social, economic, diplomatic, and military advancements. The government used oil revenues to build highways railways, factories, power plants, airports, and other infrastructure. Iran has also invested in peaceful nuclear technology in order to meet its rising energy needs. Iran is now a major producer in the steel sector. It is among the top 10 steel producing countries in recent years. When it comes to the Islamic Republic and its vision for the future, these are plans that have already been drawn up. That is what we'll be covering in this segment along with some of its accomplishments. First, the 20-year national vision, which was presented in the year 2005. Iranian society at the dawn of the national vision, the year 2024, will have these features. Development in proportion to its cultural, geographical and historic requirements founded on Islamic and revolutionary values, in possession of like in science and technology and reliant on a greater share of human resources and advancement in a secure, independent and powerful defense system based on multilateral deterrence. Perhaps at the core of the Islamic Republic's economy lies a doctrine which is called a resistance economy. Iran's resistance economy policies outlined by Ayatollah Sayyid Ali Khamenei were meant to insulate Iran from the severe effects of Western sanctions. From 2013 onward, Iran embarked on this program geared towards significantly reducing its budgetary reliance on oil. That is because the budget bills focused on things like infrastructure reforms, health and job creation. فشار حد اکثری علیه ایران شکست خفتوار خوردی تعبیر خفتوار تعبیر خود امریکایی هاست the seventh development plan was presented by Iran's leader in 2022 with a focus on economic progress. Comprising 26 provisions, the plan includes seven main chapters about economic issues, infrastructural affairs, cultural and scientific issues to name a few. According to the general policies, the seventh development plan's main goal and priority is economic progress coupled with justice with an average rate of 8% during the five-year period with an emphasis on increasing productivity, including human resources. That does it for this segment of the program. Thanks for joining us. Please send us your thoughts. We would love to hear from you. I'm Mahdi Abbasian. Looking forward to seeing you next week. The Islamic Republic of Iran has withstood the test of time. Now it is entering a new phase, a shift to the east, with countries like Russia and China, which Iran has strategic agreements with, and with its membership in trade blocs like the SCO and soon to be BRICS. The era of Western-dominated influence will come to an end, and Iran can prosper in the way that it truly deserves, because the maximum pressure campaign has failed. That does for this edition of the program. 
Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or comments, please do send them to us. Contact information is behind me. From Ikavitahwe, it's goodbye until the next economic divide.